Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3. Okay, so we are technically week 4 in our two uh, offices. Yes. Charlie, are you Baptist? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're, uh, this is week four of Baptist Distinctive Sunday School. Um, so this week we're looking at the T. So um, they're in no order of importance necessarily as far as the way it's laid out, uh, the acronym, but I put T as far as two offices first and then we'll look at the second T being two ordinances uh, later. And so today we're going to be looking at the two offices, and that would be uh, pastor and then deacon. So uh, I'm not sure we're going to get to the deacon part today, so we might extend that for next week. But I know as far as uh, primarily we're looking at uh, pastor for this week. So 1 Timothy 3, uh, starting in verse 1, it says, This is a true saying of a man desire the office of a bishop. He desireth a good work. And then he goes on and he gives a description as far as qualifications for this individual. Uh, it says, a bishop then must be blameless, a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, and then not given to wine, not, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brother, not covetous, uh, one that ruleth his own house well with his children, or having his children in subjection with all gravity. Uh, for if a man not, uh, know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Okay, so when we say office, okay, the term office, uh, we see it here used uh, in verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, okay, he desires the office of a bishop. What um, Normally you think, okay, okay, this is a position. Well, it, it is, but the actual, you, there is no, huh, there is no actual word. You have it in Hebrew as far as like its own distinctive word, but every instance as far as that I, unless I'm mistaken here, where we see where it's used in the New Testament, where let me, and later on where it speaks of uh, the deacon, that uh, he would, that, that would use the office of a deacon uh, in in verse 13 it says, For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase themselves a good uh, degree. Uh, it's the word itself uh, compounded, so the idea there would be that it's it's not its own separate distinct word. So if you're looking at it uh, as far as the original language, you're not going to find, okay, the word office, but rather you'll find the word. The idea would be behind it as far as either pastorate or, well, actually, we use that interchangeably. That's what we're going to look at today. So it would be the, the bishop or bishopric, as you would see it in uh, Acts chapter 1, or the deaconship, if you want to determine it like that. It just sounds better. It flows better if you would use an office of, uh, but it's not actually its own distinct word. But the idea is there, basically. So the idea is that, okay, for an office, it, the, it, this, I guess you could say this position. Now go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Uh, start at verse 8. Oh, excuse me, verse 7. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, uh, what is it? But he also uh, descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And then he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. 
and then for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, uh, till we all, and here's the scope of it, till we all come into the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Uh, you'd actually have to read down through to verse 16, which we could to, to get the full thought as far as the full scope of it. Uh, this is one of the few instances where you could actually find the term pastor in the New Testament. Most of the instances where you find it are going to be in Old Testament, and then when you find it, uh, if you are as if you were to look a, do a search for it, uh, for the singular form of it, uh, it's only going to be found in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, so now a pastor, the word itself just simply means like a shepherd, like uh, like a herdsman. Okay, so he's somebody that takes care of sheep or somebody that takes care of animals. Um, and then the term that's used in First Timothy is uh, bishop. And then that word uh, simply means like an overseer. Go to First Timothy 5. First Timothy 5, and then we're going to see also as well in... Uh, Book of First Peter, five, First Timothy five. Verse one it says, "Rebuke not an elder, uh, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, and then the elder women as mothers, and the younger as sisters with all purity." And go to what does elder mean there? Just is it a different word? It is a different word. Okay. Those uh, terms, bishop, pastor, and elder, are three different distinct terms, uh, which have three different distinct meanings. But they're going to be used interchangeably of the same office, referring to the same individual, and that's what we're going to be looking at here in a bit. Uh, the ideas and concepts from when they come. Are a little different. Um, verse one of First Peter chapter five. Uh, First Peter five says, "The elders which are among you, I exhort, uh, who almost, who am also an elder and witness of the sufferings, and uh, also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly." not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Okay, now there's other portions of scripture, but this one right here uses basically the three terms interchangeably, referring to one person. Right, so verse he, two, oversight, is that the word, same word for bishop there? Yes. Okay. It's Episcopal. You have, um, he's told to feed, okay, and then He's also taking in oversight. So this individual that's an elder is responsible to feed and to take oversight. Now, in the other verses that we had seen in 1 Timothy, uh, we see that an elder's referenced, in particular in, verse five, in chapter 5, it's not unique just to what would be considered the pastor, but that could be an elder as far as somebody that is older, older in the faith, older chronologically. Okay, an elder... Um, the idea with being an elder is is more of a Hebrew concept. Uh, in other words, it's somebody that's older. And so they could be older in faith, older chronologically, but uh, historically, the way Israel was governed, uh, not, a, not just up through whenever they um, were ordained judges, but not always necessarily with the judges because God was the one that sent forth the judges and as well as with the kings. But you see uh, prior to that that there was um, in God's organizational structure of leadership in Israel that the elder individuals, the elder men, were the ones that were in charge and in leadership. Now that's primarily, I believe, because uh, one, that's just God's way of his chain of command, I guess you could say, is the way he organizes and structures things. But then, from elder individuals, you would have wisdom. 
no, not, not everyone that is older chronologically is going to be wise. Uh, we're told in Proverbs that, you know, uh, the hoary head is a crown of grace if it be, if it be found, if found in the way of wisdom. So in other words, you know, there are individuals that might be chronologically older, but have been resistant in their heart towards the ways of God and their rebels in their heart still. And so they may not have learned um, or have the experience uh, of somebody that might be a little bit younger, but has been obedient <coughs> and submissive to God's will in their life. Nevertheless, the thing is, is that older individuals, uh, just by virtue of the fact that they've lived longer, they've had more to experience, and they hopefully have sought to learn and sought, to, you know, sought the Lord, are typically somebody that you would want to learn from, that you would seek out, and so that's that's God's, um, that's how God worked primarily with Israel, and so the elder system, as far as how they would govern, um, that's that's the that's the idea there. So it would be somebody that's more established, more uh, mature in the faith, uh, but it could also be somebody that would be chronologically older. So it's used interchangeably there. But you have as well, this individual um, is called a bishop in 1 Timothy 3. Now the idea there is oversight, taking oversight. What is oversight? I know it's, I'm not trying to be pedantic or insult anybody's intelligence, but what is what is oversight? Yeah, it's yes, sir. it's kind of interesting how where these where we get those words and how they we transmogrify them into into English. Uh, the bishop is the word for um, overseer, and uh, it's Greek word episkopos, which is the Episcopal Church, and then uh, presbyteros is the word for elder, which the Presbyterians have taken. So it's just it's kind of interesting how those words relate. Yeah. Yeah, the the usage of it is just basically it's somebody that would be either chronologically older that would be considered just older, mm -hmm. just more mature. Um, Charlie, yes, sir. I, uh, Chris Johnson, I live in Michigan, I pastor a little church and mission work up there. Yes, sir. I, the best way I describe it is in my past experience, I had the joy for five years to work on a real large work that had a real large bus ministry in Grand Rapids, and uh, best training I ever had. Wife's dad, and uh, I miss him dearly. He's in heaven now, but he was like the uh, bishop, well, more like the elder because he was much older than me, and he kept me in line, trained me for the ministry. He was training me to become a pastor eventually myself, but, and uh, he fed the flock as a pastor. He was doing all the preaching except for where I ministered to the children and the in the uh, bus ministry, but I was also in charge of the youth ministry. I did a little bit of the work of the bishopric, and in fact, I was an overseer over a lot of different ministries, but he was over the top of me on that because he was the elder, mm -hmm. but he was also pastor. And all, you know, he did different parts of that, and I had some of the responsibilities in, in, in that too, but I was not definitely not the elder. Mm -hmm. But, so, we use that, you know, in Baptist circles, but we don't understand we don't teach our folk that, that those offices are the same, but they are different responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's a good point. Thank you. You know, a large church, you can have a, you could have a person that's over, uh, I've seen this in a large, real large works where, uh, a, if you want to call it a minister, he's a minister of the finances. He is in charge totally of making sure, you know, the finances of a large work, we're talking about a large, hundred thousand dollar work then he can be a, um, ordained just to do that you know that's his job that'd be more like a steward right mm -hmm. yeah, a little bit of the oversight mm -hmm. you bring up a good point with regard to that um the the individual has multiple responsibilities and so the thing is it's in carrying that out in order for him to be able to be faithful to that, pleasing to the Lord, uh, it wouldn't, you know, there wouldn't be any reason for him not to be able to delegate some of that uh, to somebody and because that would be part of overseeing oversight. That's basic management. It would be um, in Ephesians 4, where we have read, he's supposed to... Um, 
mature believers so that the believers themselves, along with uh, those leadership gifts, uh, do the work of ministry. So and everybody, everybody's called to the work of ministry. Uh, if we were to go back to 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, we see that uh, we are all part of the body of Christ and members in particular. We are all gifted with at least one spiritual gift that if we are obedient, submissive to God, in the exercising thereof, we're gonna, it's, it's a, the, that gift is supposed to be so that when we exercise it, everybody else profits from that. And so God's plan has always been to, to, for us to be able to go ahead and exercise so that others are impacted, you know, drawn, drawn, to, drawn to God and motivated to, to want to serve God. Um, oh, okay, but, but in Ephesians 4, Okay, he says that, okay, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this is somewhat of an elaboration of what he had already told us uh, in Matthew 28, uh, Acts chapter 1, uh, Luke 24, John 20, and then Mark chapter 16, as far as if we're supposed to preach the gospel uh, to every creature, we're supposed to uh, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then teaching them to observe all things whatsoever, you know, Christ had commanded us. And so there's an, there's an aspect of the body of Christ that we are an organization as well, not just simply, um, yes, we are a body. Uh, in Ephesians we're told that, you know, he likens it not just as a body, but also as a bride and as a building. And then within that, we're, we're, uh, we're living, uh, not just an organism, but an organization. So we have a task that we're assigned to fulfill uh, to the pleasing of Christ. So, you know, either we're taken up or he returns. And part of that would be oversight. So in carrying out those responsibilities, uh, he can delegate as he sees fit, as he's led by the Lord. Um, and then as a, as a brother Johnson uh, Pastor Johnson had mentioned here as well, you have the feeding that has to take place. Now the the pastor, he's a shepherd. He's somebody that's responsible for uh, caring for, uh, nurturing of uh, these critters so that they, you know, are fed and they're maintained well and so that they grow so that they can use them for, um, you know, if, they're gonna, if it's a sheep, you know, you're going to want to make sure that the wool is going to be used for necessary purposes and then, um, you know, if you get off of it, well, we don't, huh, we're not under sacrificial system, so we don't have to worry about that, uh, but, you know, you want to use, you can use it for food as well. Uh, you can take from uh, from its milk and then as well as from its, its meat if you, if you need to slaughter it. But the thing is, those things, in order for it to be benef excuse me, <coughs> beneficial or profitable, to those who would partake of it, need to be well maintained and well nurtured, and that's part of the herdsman, sheep's responsibility, or sheep, sheep herders, sheep, sheepmen, uh, shepherds' responsibility. Uh, the shepherd, in our case, this is spiritual. Uh, we are to now. Obviously, we're not going to be, you know, our um, we're not going to be fleeced or that kind of thing. But uh, in order for us to be able to be profitable, to be able to stand before the Lord to heal well done, a good faithful servant, uh, as he seeks, you know, uh, through God's guidance uh, and dependence on the Holy Spirit, to feed us so that we would, in turn, if we're a submissive, obedient, uh, if we follow that leadership, uh, if we take up his feeding, and then also as he would, as he's led, as he directs us as far as within, within, within the work then that we, we would not only just ourselves obviously but profit, but also that others would be benefited by that. So that God's command over here, not only just in Matthew 28 and Acts 1, but also in, uh, we see in Ephesians 4, uh, so that we would you know, fulfill the work of ministry so that uh, the body of Christ is edified. So this individual, um, 
one individual, but three main responsibilities in that he's supposed to uh, feed, uh, he's supposed to take oversight, and then uh, he himself uh, should be an elder, somebody that would be older, mature. Go to First Peter, or excuse me, First Timothy chapter three. Well, you know what? Let's stay here. Let's stay here so we can finish this one, and then we'll go back to First Timothy three. There are some qualifications, and I kind of looked over them, but we're going to go into them in a little detail. Um, this individual is not supposed to be someone. It says here, it says taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, and then not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, and then neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Okay. So three things in particular here that we see. There's there's going to be more that we see elaborated on in First Timothy. But he says, not by constraint, but willingly. Not by constraint, but willingly. Uh, this is interesting. <laughs> I don't know that I've, now granted, I haven't been saved, I think, what, maybe 22 years. Uh, I don't know that I've ever encountered a situation like that, personally, uh, where I've met somebody that was in ministry by constraint, necessarily. But um, this is something that should be of a willing, uh, willing and ready heart, uh, someone that is in there, not for any other reason other than just simply that, he feels that God has called him, uh, he's certain that God has called him, and that uh, he's not pressured by some means uh, outside of just rather than the call of God on his life. And then, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. We see, we encounter this, and we see this more often than anything else. Um, where you have individuals that seek to take advantage of God's people. Uh, they're crooks, and they want to go ahead and uh, basically just, like, if you want to use the term, fleece the flock, they want to go ahead and take advantage uh, monetarily. And they see it as a means for them to be able to go ahead and uh, gain financially from it. Now, we know from what um, we read in... Um, 1 Corinthians 9, that uh, you know, you're not supposed to muzzle the ox, you credit out the corn. So God's plan for uh, leadership, and God's plan for the church pastorate is that he's supposed to be uh, they that uh, basically as they serve the ministry should live of the ministry. So in other words, God's plan for uh, the man of ministry is supposed to be to be um, basically to be funded by that. But he's not supposed to be somebody that has an inner drive uh, that desires, okay, I'm, I'm money hungry, I'm money motivated. That's not that's not going to be a, a motivating desire or motivating factor for somebody. Um, quite honestly, that's something that's, uh, we, and we, we read in Proverbs, somebody that trusts in money, somebody that uh, is desirous or hungry for ill gain, uh, the only end for them is going to be destruction. The thing is, money makes itself wings and flies away. It's an eagle toward heaven. And the fact is that um, God is the giver and the gifter of funds. If someone's a, uh, a proper steward, in other words, a good steward, then you know God will enable them for the, for the needs to be met. The fact is, money should not be a motivating factor. Not just for, I mean, obviously, importantly for leadership, but not as, as a Christian, period. Uh, we don't you know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. The fact is, I should have my trust and my confidence in God to provide, because uh, ultimately He's the one. He's the one that gives me strength to be able to make uh, make my living. And so, money should not be a motivating factor. And then we're told over here, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Okay. So this individual is not supposed to be somebody that. Um, in other words, bullies the flock. Uh, rather, he's going to lead by example. Now, you do have individuals that are stern, strong leaders, and that's good, that's necessary. But this isn't somebody that, uh, being a lord, is somebody that's going to basically be like a slave taskmaster. Like, in other words, this guy is 
um, do as I say, but not necessarily as I do. He's not looking to participate in the work. He's not supposed. He's not looking to be somebody, but rather so God's plan, God's idea, God's desire for this individual is supposed to be somebody that would lead by example. He's just as diligent and hard worker as any of the other individuals that he's under, you know. And he's going to set the example for that. Uh, go to First Timothy three. First Timothy three. desire office of a bishop, you desire the good work, then a bishop then must be blameless. Now this is kind of a broad term, blameless, so you can kind of figure, okay, well, what does that mean? Hi, right, good morning. How do you, how do you, how would you define blameless? Well, yes. We had a, had an incident where this came up, and that word blameless was really the key word. It was a pastor, associate pastor in a church that got involved in immorality. And he went through church discipline, and he asked if he could become the pastor, an associate pastor again. And we said no because he must be blameless. Blameless has a lot more to do with your reputation than it does with your with your actual guilt or your actual sin and your guilt. In this case, it was well known that he had done what he had done, and he couldn't be respected among the people anymore. So we told him he could not be a pastor again. I think blameless just means an accusation. If, if someone's blameless, there won't be any accusations that actually wouldn't have merit and stick. That's what it would be. It's literally without handles. In other words, you can't. He'd be like, um, if you want a more modern analogy, he's Teflon. You can, uh, I'm serious. <laughs> it's not because he's a crook. Or he's somebody that's shady that you know knows his way around things to be able to go ahead and keep from you know being accused, but rather just somebody that you're going to be attacked. In, in I'm sorry, we're in First Timothy three. First Timothy three. In church leadership, uh, any kind of ministry work, you're going to be attacked. Okay, the fact is the devil does not want to see you succeed. Uh, he's not your friend, and we have our flesh to deal with as well as the world, and they're doing their best to be able to go ahead and take down uh, God and his work. Uh, many don't like to retain God in their knowledge, and so the fact is they actively strive against whatever knowledge of God is <clears throat> out there. So that is a factor that we have to deal with. You, you, there's just no way around it. Uh, the thing is, it is possible for somebody to have, I guess you could say, sterling character, sterling reputation, where what is thrown, whatever mud is slinged to them, is not going to stick. And the fact is that 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 takes a lot of uh, basically just diligence, discipline, and just trusting God, being faithful to Him, uh, having having that uh, that pattern in your life. But he, he goes on and he defines here as far as blameless the parameters with regard to a bishop. Uh, says uh, the husband of one wife. A husband of one wife. And so this is always <laughs> argued quite frequently by many individuals. He's husband of one wife. Uh, you could say literally he's of one woman. He's a man of one woman. He's a one woman man. Okay, if you're going to take it uh, literally grammatically from the original language. So here's what it discounts. You're not going to have a pastor or somebody that calls himself that title. Um, and, and they're going to be a woman, right? That automatically eliminates somebody that is a woman. There's no woman preachers. Uh, well, <laughs> if you're going to use the term preacher, okay, that would be somebody that would proclaim the gospel. But as far as like, not, there's no woman pastors. That that's not legitimate, biblically, because it would have to. It's, he's a man. He'd have to be a man. Uh, and then of one woman. Okay, he's not going to be somebody that would be divorced or remarried. Um, no, those are two separate issues. But the fact is, he's if he's remarried, he's no longer of one woman, so he's automatically eliminated 
from that. Because um, they twain shall be one flesh, and then what God happened together, uh, let no man uh, put asunder. And so the fact is, uh, it's not going to be somebody that would be divorced. Obviously, it's not going to be somebody that would be polygamous, because it's not going to be a one woman. Uh, and you could go on. So he's husband of one wife. Okay. Uh, I would even dare say, okay, you have to be somebody that would be married because you can't get around the fact that he's, he's a husband of one wife. Uh, some would argue as far as that they would say he would have to be a one woman man. Uh, if, if they want to say that radically, but the fact is, I, I personally don't feel comfortable as far as saying um, the word of God is pretty clear. It says, okay, he's a husband of one wife, so he'd have to be married. And then it wouldn't have been somebody that would be divorced. Uh, he's vigilant. Okay, vigilant, sober, and of good behavior. Vigilant. Okay, so he's constantly looking. He's constantly going to be on the look for. Well, what are some of the things that we would encounter? Okay, bad doctrine. Okay, he's going to be on the lookout, uh, as Paul would have told uh, the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter twenty. Okay, day and night he didn't cease to go ahead and teach and preach, not only just from the word of God, but also to go ahead. And warn them as far as that grievous wolves were going to come following his departure. Um, so he's going to be somebody that's going to be diligent about uh, God's business, okay, looking over his flock. Um, he's sober. Now this is not also necessarily about um, not drunken. In other words, okay, this guy is uh, not a drunkard, but rather he's he's serious. He's he's not somebody that is you know like a, a space cadet basically mentally. You know, so he's, yeah, he's so he's sober minded. He's serious about the the work of God. He's serious about uh, that. Doesn't mean that he doesn't have a cheerful demeanor or that he doesn't joke around. But rather, he's serious. He's serious about the things of God. Uh, he's serious about God's work. Uh, he's serious about his responsibility. Then of good behavior, he's orderly. He's going to be somebody that is, you know, doing good. Okay? He's not going to have a reputation in a church house that is different from what would be outside. You know, if he's somebody that would be bivocational, uh, he's not going to be one thing at work and then another different thing at home, or one thing uh, at church and then a, a different thing at home as well. Okay, he's, he's going to be a, he's going to be consistent. He's going to be a good behavior. Um, given to hospitality, given to hospitality, okay? This one's pretty interesting. Okay, he literally is love of strangers, right? So in other words, this guy loves people, okay? He's going to be somebody that actually is uh, a lover of people. Apt to teach, apt to teach. When I read that, I normally think, okay, so he's ready to go to teach. But the idea there is that he has an aptitude to teach. Okay, so if this guy doesn't have teaching ability, now you could learn that. You that you could learn actually a number of these things you can actually learn. And most of these things were actually commanded to do in scripture, uh, as far as just regular Christian behavior. But as far as somebody that would seek to be a pastor, uh, you know, a leader of God's work, uh, you're gonna be instructing. So you have to have an aptitude as far as to be able to communicate God's truth to people. And then not given to wine, and then you know he's not he's going to be disciplined. So not particularly here with wine, but you're not going to have. Um, well, Paul states it like this in First Corinthians nine that he keeps under his body, lest by any means that while he's preached to others, he might be himself a castaway. Okay, so in other words, you're going to be disciplined about letting external influences control you. Uh, but you're not you're not giving the wine. Okay, no striker. Uh, he says no striker, no brawler. Okay, no striker, no brawler. Those seem very similar, but here would be the distinct or the difference. Okay, so you got somebody that's got like a temper to them, and then you know they, they kind of like want to fly off the handle constantly, or then you got somebody that uh, is basically you know. Just ready for a fight, you know, at the diamond, at the drop of a hat, and you know, they'll throw down the hat. 
<clears throat> somebody that's ready to go to blows that can't control their temper physically as far as to keep from getting handsy with somebody as well as just having a, <laughs> a temperament to them that they're ready to explode at any given time. Okay? You can't. Um, in Titus, well, we're not, I don't know if we're going to get that far, but in Titus we're told that he must be patient. Okay, the, the individual, this individual that they speak of, is supposed to be somebody that is patient. In other words. Go, uh, let's go to Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. We'll go, we'll go back to 1 Timothy 3 here, but it's Titus chapter 1. Uh, we'll start at verse 6 because it's going to go over a lot of the same things. It's like, it's, it's, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, as a steward of God, not self willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, uh, holding fast a faithful word that he hath been taught that he may be able to that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Okay, uh, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Interesting. <clears throat> God wants to win those that oppose him. Okay, so you're not looking to want to fight. That's our natural human tendency and that's our natural human inclination to want to, you know, somebody gets on our face obviously, or somebody gets uh, in, in opposition to us, so, you know, we just want to take them out. And God's attitude towards them here, he says that um, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? Because God loves them. He wants to win them. All right, so those that would scoff, those that would mock. I mean, I know we have uh, teaching with regard to, in the book of Proverbs, how to deal with mockers and scoffers. Uh, but the fact is, those that would gainsay, those that would attack, those would detract from God's teaching, God wants to win. And so we have to, or and this individual would have to be somebody that would have that temperament uh, and go about it to want to say, hey, okay, look, God wants to win you. And so he has to be knowledgeable in the Word of God to be able to go ahead and, and not only respond to refute and answer, but as far as to convince and to exhort uh, the, these individuals that would detract, that would gainsay. Not given to filthy lucre. You're going to get to that? Yes, actually we... So that's in the same verse there? Yes. Yeah. The not given to filthy lucre See, so many pastors that that you know they got to have golden chandeliers and they just you know have you build these mega churches and they enrich themselves. And I've also seen it in fairly poor churches where pastors just want to live like kings and take advantage of the flock. I don't want to give any specific examples, but that's just a. I think it's the curse of our age. It's lay out to see in church we live in. It's the church age we live in. They're not supposed to be somebody that's money motivated. Uh, they're not supposed to, actually that'd be the next thing. It says, they're not greedy. Uh, they're not greedy to fill the lucre. And then, but they're supposed to be patient. And then they're not supposed to be covetous. Okay, the, um, covetousness, covetousness doesn't just extend to money, but it's, it's all encompassing. It, it actually is really the last two of the Ten Commandments. That's really, you can summarize it you can, by saying basically, don't covet. Um, and so the fact is, covetousness, we're told in Colossians that it's, uh, it's idolatry. And that's witchcraft as well. Um, covetousness is the root of <coughs> adultery. Covetousness is the root of really quite a number of different sins that extend out. Um, your immorality descends from that. Um, 
So a, a lot of the great wicked stuff stems from somebody that says, okay, I need this because I deserve it. I want it. Therefore, I, you know, I'm going to do whatever I want to to get it rather than letting God control their heart and cleansing themselves from not only just, you know, filthiness of the flesh, but also within their mind and having their minds transformed and purified by God's word and let God input his desires and then have him work out his will and to do it uh, and his good pleasure in their life. But, uh, yeah, not, not greedy of the filthy lucre and not covetous. So this individual, if he's money motivated, uh, if he's somebody that is uh, desirous of, you know, of money, uh, in any way. It's not to say that you're not a good steward, uh, but the fact is is that if that's a controlling factor, you know, run away. The fact is this, that he's not he's not of the right mindset, he's not of the right mentality. Uh, the fact is, is a good steward is going to be somebody that trusts God uh, for what they have. Uh, they're going to be obedient to God's word, they're going to be diligent, disciplined, uh, but they're going to be somebody that trusts God ultimately, and God's the one that provides and then, obviously, patient. And um, okay, one that ruleth his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. And here is the explanation given for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Okay. Uh, if your kids are out of control, uh, your wife is out of control, and your house is out of control, uh, the fact is that. It's, Pretty consistent pattern, you know. The church is going to be out of control. You're not. You don't know how to govern. Uh, if the house is a mess, um, as far as his leadership in it, then the fact is he needs to work on that rather than trying to. I don't know. Trying to trying to lead people. The fact is you can't lead anybody beyond where you have gone. Uh, now you can't. Obviously, we're supposed to all point people to Christ. Um, we're supposed to lead by example with regard to, but the people only follow us as they follow Christ. And, you know, obviously I know we're all sinners, uh, but the fact is there is a standard. And um, we can't expect people to rise above or to have that desire to go above and beyond if we ourselves aren't living that example. Uh, I'm not even going to get to this. Okay, so not a novice who we're going to look at. And then having a good report of them that are without. <laughs> I'm out of time. We're going to have to look at this more in depth next week. And then we'll get into as far as the deacons. Because he mentions the same things as far as for the deacons and then who they are. Uh, and um, just quickly, not a novice. And then having a good report. Uh, obviously, it should be somebody that's experienced. That's where the idea of an elder so it would be somebody that would be mature in the faith and then uh, having a good report. Okay, that's having, being a good testimony. So if you're consistent in your private life, then you're going to be consistent in your public life. Uh, if you're walking with God privately, it's going to show publicly. Um, and so you should be one thing in one place and something else out public. Does anybody have any questions? I know we went through this a little quickly. What did you just teach? That's what I'm all right. For, <laughs> no, just we went over the pastor, like who he was, his responsibilities, and then we were just going over his qualifications. Right. We're just for context. We're going through the Baptist distinctives, a little acronym, B A P T. The two offices. That's where we are. The two offices: the deacon and the elder. All right. So, no questions. All right. We're dismissed. Thank you.